Well, hello everyone and welcome back to my library. If you're new here, hello, my name is Chinsia and if you're not new and you are my lovely regulars, hi, how are you? I hope you're doing splendidly. So today we're going to be covering the Amazon, the Amazon female warriors, the mystical, magical beings that feature prevalently in the myths. However, are they actually as fake as we think they are? Are they entirely mythological? There's so many things to debunk about the Amazons and their conceptualizations. So this is kind of a mini debunking. I'm not going to go into full depth of the Amazons themselves because there's a lot to cover. They could be many videos. However, let's just get the basics done. Let's debunk what we think we know about the Amazon warriors and what we actually know about them, if they are real or not. We'll find out. So. Who were the Amazons? Well, according to Greek mythology, the Amazons were fierce warrior women who lived somewhere in the Black Sea region and were as courageous and skilled in battle as the mightiest Greek heroes. Every Greek hero, Heracles, Theseus and Achilles, proved their strength by overcoming and defeating the man-killing queens and their armies. The legend has it that the Amazonian women were so dedicated to being warriors that they cut off one of their lady lumps to be able to wield a bow better, a myth clearly constructed by a person who's never wielded a bow whilst having lady lumps. So warning, we're about to talk about lady lumps for a bit and I have to call it that otherwise YouTube gods will punish my video. So I'm actually a former archer, an award-winning one at that, but I obviously can't testify as to whether or not lady lumps would get in the way of my performance because I haven't got the resources to conduct that experiment. However, for an archer to have their, you know, performance impeded by lady lumps, they'd have to be impressively endowed. And even then, archers today with rather larger lady lumps uh, usually adapt their stance when drawing a bow, or they actually use a guard that flattens part of their chest, something which the Amazonian woman could have done with armour or bandaging. There'd be no need to chop one off and potentially bleed to death. So unless all Amazonian women had massive lady lumps, which I'm sure the men writing these myths would have loved to imagine they did, uh, there would be no need to chop one off to be a powerful archer. But this is actually a relevant talking point, and you're probably thinking, why are you talking about lady lumps? Well, it's because it links to the other biggest misconception, and it's actually almost supported by this misconception, is basically people believe that the Amazon name derives from their singular lady lumpness. And this claim is actually widely repeated amongst Greek and Roman writers, all of whom said that the word Amazon came from the word A without an mazon, lady lump, you know, which comes from the same root as maste in mastectomy. However, this misconception about Amazon discussing singular lady lumpness, or rather without lady lumpness, uh, actually it came into existence at least two centuries after the Greeks actually started using the name Amazon to describe this ethnic group. And all of this actually goes back to uh, this historian, uh, Hellenikos of Lesbos. Now, he was someone who discussed the Amazons quite a lot. He described them as, and I quote, a host of golden shielded, silver axed, man loving, boy killing females. And why he's interesting is because this historian, Hellenikos, actually attempted to make their foreign name, Amazon, into a Greek word by trying to break it down etymologically into Greek language, but the word was not originally Greek. He basically argued that it must mean no lady lumps because he broke the word into a and then mazon. However, there were even some other Greeks at the time who thought, that, no, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean without lady lumpness. It actually means without grain because maza was Greek for barley. And the Scythian nomads that they were discussing, the Amazons, they were only meat eaters. But we have to go back to ancient times. You know, there are some ancient Greeks like Hellenikos who were saying it means they haven't got lady lumps, whilst the others were like, it means they don't eat like grains. They're, they're not vegetarian in the slightest. They're only meat eaters. Which one's going to get more traction? Out of popular, you know, discussion, gossip, lore, which one sounds more interesting? Obviously, Hellenikos's without lady lumps was far more entertaining. And this breakdown of the word into without lady lumps created the opportunity to make a fantastic myth out of it. How can you explain this? We have to explain this somehow. And thus the myth of them having but a singular lady lump arose entirely out of wordplay. Now you're probably thinking, well, what does Amazon actually mean then? If it's not a Greek word and they broke it down into meaningless, where does it come from and what does it mean? 
Well, we're not entirely sure. All we do know is that it is not a Greek word originally, and therefore it doesn't make sense to give it a Greek etymological foundation. But what are the alternatives? Well, there are quite a few actually. <laughs> Some people today actually believe that the word derived from the ancient Iranian word for warrior, which is Hamazon, whilst another potential source comes from the Circassian name Amazane, which means forest or moon mother. There's also quite an interesting link, which I think is quite strong, which there was a heroic horsewoman warrior queen of the Nart sagas called Amizan, whose lore derives from the Caucasus region. So whatever its source, the word entered the Greek language along with the stories of heroic warrior women of Scythia via the Black Sea trading colonies where Caucasian, Iranian and earlier Indo-European languages were spoken. And the timing's pretty appropriate because at that time, female warriors began appearing in Greek art around the 8th century BCE and the first mention of the Amazons in Greek literature was Homer's Iliad, which was produced at the same time. So, okay, let's talk briefly about the legend of the Amazonians. There were many Amazonian queens that were discussed, but the most renowned is Penthesilea, the daughter of the war god Ares, and who, according to Pliny, invented the battle axe itself. Whilst Penthesilea's sister, Hippolyta, became prominent figure in both the Theseus myth, she becomes his wife, and in the Heracles' myth of the Twelve Labours, Penthesilea became famous for her battle with Achilles. Penthesilea ruled the Amazons during the years of the Trojan War. The Amazons actually stayed quite far away from the Trojan War and didn't get involved until Achilles killed Hector, which is when they decided to come in for the aid of the Trojans, who were fellow Anatolians. And if you're unfamiliar, Anatolia is another name for Asia Minor. Another popular misconception with Penthesilea is that we read about her fight with Achilles in the Iliad, but the Iliad actually ends with Hector's funeral before the Amazons arrive. Penthesilea's story is actually told in a lost ancient epic called the Aethiopis, a poem detailing Achilles' great deeds and his slaughters of several famous warriors, including Memnon, king of Ethiopia, and Penthesilea. The most popular version of her death actually comes from the Bibliotheca of Pseudo Apollodorus, who describes how Achilles actually fell in love with Penthesilea, and though he stabs her to death, he then holds her as she dies. It's so romantic. But everything about the Amazon women that I've discussed so far seems mythological enough to justify being the product of the Greek imagination. They were a tribe of women warriors who lived in a society governed strictly and exclusively by women, in which men were only allowed in for the purposes of procreation or slavery. And unlike the women of Greek society, they went to war and they fought like men using bows and arrows and libris and shields. And they had but one lady lump. They were the beautiful, untamed, exotic women who needed slaying and taming by the ancient heroes. But the lines between myth and reality become slightly blurred when historical figures are brought into the mix. You see, Alexander the Great, King Cyrus of Persia and the Roman general Pompey are all described as having run-ins with the Amazonian women. And the funniest one is actually that, you know, the fascinating legend of Alexander the Great and his affair with the Amazonian queen Thalestris. Now, according to the historian Justin in 12.3.5-8, Thalestris visited Alexandra in Hyrcania, which is in northern Haran, and whilst he was conquering the Persian Empire. Justin claims that she travelled for 25 days with 300 attendants just to meet Alexander and have a child with him. Now, that's a lynx advert if I've ever heard of one. Astonished by her mission and the military attire, you know, 300 people's pretty impressive, Alexander rested his army for 13 days to honour Thalestris request and they did their thing and then she left once she believed she was pregnant however Justin's story is actually based on a discredited account by Onesicritus a philosopher and historical writer who actually accompanied Alexander on his eastern expedition in an attempt to mimic Xenophon's writing style Onesicritus wrote a book about Alexander called how Alexander was educated which, though presented as an eyewitness account of the expedition, was ridiculed by other eyewitnesses and historians, including Lysimachus, the Salian officer and successor of Alexander the Great, Strabo and Arian. But despite the myths of the Amazonian women interacting with real-life historical figures being historically ridiculed, uh, there's more evidence than not 
to suggest that some of the Amazonian mythology may have been based on fact, primarily based on the horse riding peoples of the steppes, known to the Greeks as the Scythians, which you've heard me reference earlier. You see, okay, so Scythia is actually quite a fluid term in antiquity. For the Greeks, Scythia stood for an extensive cultural zone of a great many loosely connected nomadic and semi-nomadic ethnic and language groups that ranged over the great swath of territory extending from Thrace to the Black Sea and the northern Anatolia across the Caucasus Mountains and the Caspian Sea and eastward to Central and Inner Asia. So quite a big area. <laughs> According to Herodotus, the Scythians originally inhabited Asia but were pushed west by hostile tribes until they eventually reached the Black Sea region and the eastern outskirts of Europe, where they, in turn, pushed out the existing inhabitants. <laughs> Herodotus tells how the Scythians were actually descendants of Heracles and a creature who was half woman and half snake. And in this story, Heracles encounters the creature whilst traveling the lands east of Greece. And she steals Heracles' horses and then uses them to blackmail Heracles to stay with her and mate with her. And this union produced three sons, one of whom is named Scythus, who became the ancestor of the Scythian nobility. By contrast, Diodorus Siculus, the writer of the 1st century BCE, claimed that the Scythians moved north into the steppe region from the south, possibly from the modern area of Armenia, or even further south along the western border of India. So again, we don't really know where the Scythians were. They're quite a broad, fluid context. However, what unsettled the Greeks the most about Scythian culture was the status of the women within it. So in the Scythian culture, men and women actually wore the same practical clothing, i.e. they wore trousers. You see, in the Scythian culture, everyone was expected to pull their weight for the community, so women were taught how to ride horses, hunt and fight. According to Pomponius Mela, the earliest Roman geographer, the Sarmatians, who were part of the Scythian culture, were warlike, free, unconquered, and so savage and cruel that women also go to war side by side with men. Could you imagine? Actually, I mean, come on, it would be so bloody useful, sacrificing for more people. Archaeology today reveals about one out of three or four nomad women of the steppes was an active warrior buried with her weapons, which is a stark contrast compared to the domesticated women of ancient Greece, and thus the Scythian women became powerful muses for mythological storytelling. So whilst the Amazons were an invention of the Greek imagination, the reference sources for their conception were very much real. But despite their rich culture, the Saka Scythians, Thracians, Samartians, and the others left no written history because they were nomads. They were carrying very little with them, if anything at all, and what they carried with them was very essential to them. So technically, all we know about them from a literary sense comes from the Greco-Roman, Iranian, Armenian, Azerbaijanian and Kakistanian, Indian and Chinese written sources. But since the 1870s, numerous archaeology teams have uncovered more evidence backing up the Greek claims of the Scythian culture. So even though they're Amazonian, there seems to be a, a relevance of Amazonian female warriors. And they seem like a really interesting culture. You know, from what archaeologists have found, we can tell so many things about the Scythians. Like, they loved their horses, so much so that the saddle horses, when they died, were buried wearing, like, elaborate costumes, including, like, headgear with griffins and antlers on them. And their saddle covers were all decorated with combat scenes. And they had long dangling pendants on them. It's very impressive. We also know about the Scythians is that they love to get high and drink a lot, which actually Herodotus talks about in book four of his histories. He says, the Scythians then take the seed of this hemp and creeping under the mats, they throw it on a red hot stones and being so thrown, it smoulders and sends forth such a steam that no Greek vapor bath could surpass it. The Scythians howl in their joy at the vapor bath. This serves them instead of bathing, so they never wash their bodies with water. Apparently that's a thing you can do, but yeah, they really love to get high. Also what's interesting about the Scythians is that all the frozen Scythian bodies examined so far from different sites are heavily tattooed. As I'm going to show you a fragment of a mummified skin so you can see. They were tattooed all over their arms and legs. And Speaking of which, yes, they were mummified as well. They mummified their dead. And the women who were mummified were buried with the same honours as men. They were equipped with their weapons and anything else they might need in the afterlife. A lot of their bodies have been very well preserved because in the high Altai mountain region near the borders of Russia, Kazakhstan, China and Mongolia, the frozen subsoil has meant that the organic remains of the Scythians buried in the tombs have been exceptionally well preserved by the permafrost. So we have a lot of resources here about 
what they were like and what they physically were like, but we just don't have any written resources about them except for other people's. So whilst the Greeks actually used their creative license to play around with what they knew about the Scythians to create these Amazonian legends of one lady lumped monstrous women who refused to marry, they weren't based entirely from the Greek imagination, as archaeological evidence has now unearthed more than 300 warrior women from what was once the Scythian regions, proving that they aren't as symbolic or mythological as people may believe, although <laughs> there are tweaks to how they constructed themselves. They were very much part of a, you know, multi-gendered culture. It wasn't just women living alone, and they probably weren't just killing off the men, but they were powerful women. And that was frightening to the Greeks, who would otherwise, you know, dismiss women as having any possibility of fighting, hunting, etc., doing what men could do. And therefore, basically, primarily through sexism, they kind of demonise these women and put them as a mythological danger that needs to be slaughtered by the great Greek heroes. And inadvertently kind of told other women through those myths, uh, don't be like that, we kind of hate these kind of people, they're effectively deserving of being conquered, they are monstrous women out there, when in reality they were just doing their things, the Scythian women were just doing their life, living their life, smoking weed, getting completely drunk and high all the time, and hunting and eating meat, with both of their lady lumps completely intact. So I hope you enjoyed this wee little video of debunking what we know about the Amazons and what they really were, the Scythians, and just a a little insight into the culture. Everything that I actually kind of used as my material today comes from uh, this book that I'm reading, The Amazons by Adrian Mayer. Mayer is a huge scholar in this and I use Mayer's book but also a lot of the references in the back. I highly recommend this book. I'll link it down below if you're interested with an affiliate link if you fancy supporting my channel. This video is brought to you by my Patreons. Thank you very much for my Patreons for supporting me. There'll be a new video this week over on there and we'll be doing a live stream soon with the Patreons, which will be exclusive to them. So I will link the date in the Patreon so you know when it's due. Thank you again for watching today's video. Thank you to my Patreons for sponsoring this video and I will see you on Thursday for another video. And remember, books save lives, so keep reading.